the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to deliver a, a talk uh, on this topic. Uh, frankly speaking, I did not expect uh, such a large audience. First of all, the first word uh, in the title is spiritual, so that will put many people off. That's normal. So, uh, thank you for such an abnormal presence. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the topic is actually very big and it will not be a justice to uh, devote only an hour or so to the subject. So, I will try to uh, give you a flavor focusing on the key aspects uh, of this subject. And uh, if you are interested then we can continue later and I can give a series of talks if the audience and the uh, college authority feels it to be appropriate. Okay? So not all questions can be answered in one day, but you are feel, you, you must feel free to ask any questions at any time. I try to answer as much as I can in the limited time and scope. So before I start talking about uh, success, so everybody has his or her own definition of success in life of achievement. So my question to you is, uh, what is the goal of your life? So that when you reach that goal, you can say, wait, I am successful. Say, I am happy. Be a business tycoon. Be good. Any other goal? <coughs> To understand the purpose of humanity. To understand the purpose of humanity. Good. That's a different sort of goal. Anyone else? If you don't speak anything, then should I assume that you do not have any goals? Yes. Sir, to get stronger. To get stronger? Then yeah, you should go to a gym, not to a college. Eh? Okay. Fine. Uh, next. Sir, your topic was speech and algorithm leading to material success. And if my goal is to, when I'm in a shopping complex and I don't have to look at the price tag before I get that product, how can a speech and algorithm lead me to that success? Okay, I will uh, explain that. <laughs> Any other goals in life? Be a good technician as well as a good leader. Be a good technician as well as a good leader. Good. Okay, so let's continue. So, the thing is that everybody of you has different goals. So the next question is why is this particular thing your goal? For example, that gentleman there uh, talked that to become strong mentally and intellectual and spiritual is my goal. So why? So the next question is why? So everything should have a purpose, right? right? We are rational animals. So all our behaviors should be justified at least to some extent. Not everything can be justified, but at least to some extent. So why is, for example, business tycoon? Why your technician? Why buy that item in the shopping complex? <laughs> if you don't know why, then why you make it? That's why. Why do you go for it? You could go for anything else, right? I just love it. So that means uh, if you don't do it probably you won't love that thing, right? And so, for example, if you don't become a business tycoon, probably you will be unhappy. I will be unhappy, but I will try to Okay. So, my point is that uh, everything that you want to do in your life, okay, whatever is your goal, we do it for pleasure. So, whether you want to dance or you want to 
you know, take a pet, or you want to do gardening, or you want to eat something, or you want to have some particular profession in your life, or to make party, all the activities are oriented towards happiness and pleasure. So that's the bottom line. Whatever you want to do. You think that, okay, becoming a businessman will make you happy, buying a particular list of items from the shopping complex will make you happy because you will enjoy it. That's not. So that's the common goal. <coughs> so whenever we talk about algorithms, right? So the thing is that it should run for all the inputs. Right? It should it should work for all possible inputs. If you have a sorting algorithm, it should sort all possible input sequences. Similarly, whenever we're talking about a success algorithm, so that means that should work for everybody. So that means it should extract the common feature of all the inputs. So everybody must have different goals, different uh, purposes, but the bottom line is to become happy, <coughs> uh, to enjoy, to have pleasure in life. That's the bottom line. So if an algorithm gives you that, then that is fine. So in order to achieve your goals in your life, you go through different stages. For example, we go through education. So that's not a happy path altogether. I don't have to explain much. It's a pretty stressful thing. So when we, uh, when we are in college, at least when I look back now, I can tell for myself, and probably you, uh, many of you may not experience it now, but I'm sure 10 years down the line you will. The thing is that we tend to think that once I get a very good job, so I will be happy. So that's the end of my life. I don't have to study anymore. No pressure. Just go to office, get salary, buy anything you want. Boom, right? That's what most of us think. I would not say everybody, but most of us. Problem is, after the education, when you get to job, the situation changes. <laughs> so, at least, I mean, I have done at least a hundred of surveys from my friends and friend of friends and many other individuals working in different industry, different sector, different position, from normal employee to manager to vice president and all, but this is the experience. Okay. So, it does not give you happiness. But then you think, when you are doing a job, that, okay, so I am doing it for future, so let me store a lot of money when I am doing the job, so this is the hard work time. Then ultimately, when I retire for my job, then I can enjoy life real. I can do whatever I want, because there will be no boss on top of my head to tell me what to do, and I will become real happy. So, before retirement comes family, <coughs> again, probably many of you would not agree now, but let's wait, I will hear from you after a few years. Okay. I hope the picture is self-explanatory. <coughs> so, what I was uh, saying that during job, when you plan for retirement, then you have to think about whether you have pension or not, whether you have to pay any old loans or not, investment, insurance, and then you have to take care of inflation. So no matter how much you save, you may not be able to catch up with that. And even if you have billions and trillions of money, you cannot avoid health hazards. That's normal when you age. Right? Sometimes you have deadly diseases which cannot be cured, even with infinite amount of <coughs> So this is the natural thing be it in old age or in your time. And finally, death is the biggest source of unhappiness because it stops all your plans, all your activities, and it can come at any point of time in life. So, we know, we all of us know this. I mean, it's nothing new. Sometimes we think about it and sometimes we don't think. Most of the time, we try to forget these things. So basically what we try to do, we try to avoid. We, we try to, we do not try to address the problems. We try to take an escape route. We try to forget these problems temporarily. Look for some reliefs. 
We take a vacation, for example, a break that we have to forget everything, education, job, family problems, all together. Okay? But the problem is the happiness we experience is just temporary cessation of misery. So, I mean, it's a frame of reference. Uh, you may not agree, but at least one view to look at it is that you have continuous problems, continuous unhappiness, and continuous misery, and intermittently you have a temporary stops. <laughs> so that's the part of it. When we analyze what are the sources of this misery or unhappiness, we are planning so many things, but uh, what's coming in the way? So there are three main sources we can identify. Source one, natural calamities, which is not in your control, right? You can, you can build a big house, but then with earthquake it may go away. Or for example in tsunami, you see so many problems. Next is other living entities. So even if you are peaceful and you know you try to be happy, so the other people will not let you remain uh, peaceful. So that's another problem. And the third source is your own body and mind. So you have your diseases, both physical and mental, depression, anxiety, everything else. So these are the three main sources. So when you look for solution, solution can be of two types. First of all, face these problems and win over them. That uh, could be one approach. And the second one can be uh, not to look at the problems individually, but to find out uh, the root of all these problems, if there is any common root or not, or if there are multiple roots. Try to identify them and just eradicate the roots of uh, those problems altogether. Or you can uh, try these two simultaneously. There is also no harm. Because the second one is going to take a lot of time. You never know. The first one is uh, probably going to take less time. Okay. So, that's it. So, the material approach to uh, address these problems typically can be summarized uh, as follows. So. We think that if we have a lot of money somehow, either through business or through job, then we can solve these problems. So for example, so other living entities, if they attack, so with money you can buy a lot of security guards, right? They will protect you from other attacks. Okay. So you can build earthquake resistant house or something. So, so that could be one approach. If you have a lot of money, you can buy anything you want. Another thing is, <coughs> Uh, to become very famous, say a famous player or a famous uh, <coughs> celebrity, be a movie star, something like that. So that means everybody is following you and you are enjoying that. And the third way of addressing these issues is to have a lot of power in you. Okay? So power in terms of influencing others. So all, whatever you say, others follow. Whatever you ask others to do, they do it in your command. So that's the power. So apparently, if you have one of these things or all of these things, <coughs> or some of these things, that would be one way to address these problems. But have you ever questioned that, or have you ever asked these persons who have achieved this, so, for example, the people who have had most of the money of the world or the people who have most of the fame or most of the power, are they happy or do they think they have achieved everything in life or they have achieved success uh, in life? I see your question. Sir, so these are the ways to success means attaining money or power or fame and everything. Why did Michael's action and written us for type of cases came in the that's exactly my question. So thank you for uh, <clears throat> thank you for pointing out what I was going to say. So actually, these examples of Michael Jackson and other people, you know, bring us to a juncture of question and of introspect. That okay, so is it real success that we are aiming for? Because the people who have achieved this, they are not happy. 
so so for example one of my uh, very close friend my classmate so he used to work in Seattle Microsoft head office and he was working in the Bing <coughs> search engine so Bill Gates uh, used to come and have a meeting with uh, his group every week and uh, <coughs> so he observed uh, Bill Gates closely and told me that he's a very miserable guy I mean, <laughs> he's very much under depression and anxiety all the time and he scolds everybody out of any reason and nobody likes him so and he's unhappy of the fact that nobody likes him but he behaves in such a way that nobody likes him so I think can help so anyway <clears throat> so that's the bottom line so what are the real facts so there was a world happiness survey conducted by London School of Economics thought to be one of the premier institute of economics in 2009 and according to their survey they found out so they did it over 150 nations across the world for few years so United States the country which we think to be the happiest country on average <coughs> ranked 46 United Kingdom ranked 32 India ranked 5 Bangladesh ranked 1 so again this is counter intuitive and surprising like all of us wants to <laughs> they are better than United States and UK very close to India so so the point is from India Bangladesh and Pakistan all of us are trying to go to UK and US and settle there but London School of Economics is saying that we are moving from happiness to unhappiness actually because uh, this is a global survey and not by any you know, private organization or anybody else by a London School of Economics so they identified so they wanted to ask what is the reason so basically the way they did it uh, you go to PayPal and uh, you give some question here for example whether you have uh, whether you are satisfied with your job or not then you will have some scale say between 1 to 10 say 10 is most satisfied 1 is least satisfied then you put a score right so that's the kind of statistical analysis that you do and then you find the average and standard deviation and other metrics across a huge set of people and this fact cannot be ignored because it's over a huge data huge number of samples it's, it's not just one particular office and a few employees so the main reasons they identified behind it so the key feature according to them is close personal relationship so the countries which have <coughs> close personal relationship among individuals <coughs> they are <coughs> happier good health that's another reason and job satisfaction and another interesting thing is that job satisfaction is not uh, what they found is not correlated with uh, your salary so normally um, if you put the salary in the x-axis and if you put the job satisfaction index you ask people to rate themselves right how much satisfied they feel say in a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 100 you put it in the y-axis and try to see if there is any pattern if you can um, fit a function you can if you can fit a car but it turns out that they are <coughs> so so initially you can find some correlation but then after some point uh, they become uncorrelated so that's the observation and this is counterintuitive to other measures of growth and development of countries because normally in terms of standard uh, economic models India, Bangladesh, Pakistan and these are third world countries underdeveloped or developing countries and the measure is usually in terms of GDP and say the national income, the poverty level, all these big big metrics but these metrics do not capture the notion of happiness, success and satisfaction that's what they found okay. so that <coughs> brings me to the point uh, where I can talk about spiritual approach because these issues, precisely these issues, the good health, both physical health and mental health, job satisfaction, which is not correlated with your salary, and a close personal relationship, how to build it, how to sustain it. And these things 
are not taught in normal uh, uh, material curriculum, neither in physics or chemistry or in biology okay, or in engineering. So to these things we have to look into social sciences or social studies, philosophy and spirituality. So someone raised a hand. Any question? So, spiritual approach, so I started uh, uh, my talk talking about algorithm. So, whenever you talk about algorithm, we must define what are the objects and entities that I am talking about. So, the first object is body, object one in our model. Body is nothing but <coughs> consisting of the five senses, that all of you know. Next object is the mind, which is the next uh, layer. Mind is just a repository of thoughts and uh, feelings. So, in every second, thousands and thousands of thoughts and feelings bombard your mind. Second object is intelligence. <coughs> so that acts on logic and rationality. And basically, it's the power of discrimination. So mind and intelligence actually work together. <coughs> Mind throws away thoughts and ideas and feelings. It's the task of the intelligence to act as a filter and to decide that, okay, I have so many thoughts, so many plans, but which one to act upon? So then you rationally try to decide that, okay, I reject these ideas, I accept these ideas. So that's the thing. The fourth object that I want to talk is soul. Uh, consciousness in any living being is the symptom of soul is the cause of life in a living being and it gives you self-identity or being aware of one's own existence. <coughs> now at this point I am sure that many of you will not have any objection regarding body, mind and intelligence because at least whatever is mind whether it's a product of brain or product of hormone or it's an abstract entity Without going into that argument, at least you accept that there is something called body, something called body, something uh, called mind, something called intelligence. At least they exist, you agree. But about the fourth topic, there might be some controversy. So I will try to, again, it's not a matter of proof or disproof. It's a model. And in any model, we try to justify the model, try to find evidences. Okay. So, Let's have a glimpse of what uh, few uh, eminent personalities talk about soul. So for example, if you go back to BC, uh, Socrates and Pythagoras, Plato. Uh, Plato, Socrates, they were uh, the premier promoter of Aristotelian logic, which is the foundation of modern logic. So they accounted about reincarnation and soul. And even Pythagoras in his diary claimed to remember his past life. Then we have Giordano Bruno, Voltaire, <coughs> Benjamin Franklin, the so-called discoverer of electricity, Napoleon, the German poet Goethe, uh, Emerson, Thoreau, <coughs> Walt Whitman, Charles Dickens, Leo Tolstoy, and many others. These are, these are just some examples that I collected. Okay. Fine. So these are just examples, but these, these are not evidences. Anybody can claim and write anything. So now let me focus on some example of modern scientific research. Okay? So the first example I will give you about an experiment by Dr. Wilder Penfield, FRS fellow of uh, Royal Society, writes in his book The Mystery of the Mind about an experiment. So the experiment was that he identified the parts of the brain that uh, that are involved in, say, for example, uh, raising your arm. So uh, he put electrodes and probes and tried to measure signals and other things, activation and deactivation of uh, particular neurons and so on. So uh, initially what he did, he asked uh, one patient to raise uh, his arm and measured uh, the activation and deactivation regions in the brain. Okay. And then ask the patient uh, okay, 
what did you do? The patient said, okay, I raised my arm. In the next phase of the experiment, what he did, he artificially excited those regions of the brain by uh, feeding external impulses, electrical impulses, okay? So, activated the same way. So, physically, from, uh, from brain's point of view, or from neurological points of view, it is the same. Objectively, there is no difference. And he asked the patient that, uh, and the arm went up this time also. So he asked the patient, what did you do? The patient said, uh, my arm went up. So you see the difference between the response. The first time the patient says, I raised my arm. And the second time the patient says, my arm went up. So that means there is a distinct feeling of something that I am doing, a self-identity or being conscious of one's own existence, then I am raising my, my arm. So this has nothing to do with voluntary and involuntary nervous system that all of you know because raising your hand is always a voluntary event. But uh, so it's not like say, swallowing or something else, some other activity that's controlled by involuntary nervous system. So this is different from that. And so that raises the question that, so who is this I? So another, uh, there are uh, many articles by Dr. Wilfred Bigelow, who is the former head of the cardiovascular surgery unit at Toronto General Hospital. So he observed many people, many people having near-death experiences, and he was one of the inventor of the pacemakers and also a uh, famous uh, heart surgery called hypothermia. So he, from his encounter of near-death experiences with his patient. Uh, was convinced that there is something about soul and because these items are not talked about in general in academia he said that the research must be taken uh, in all universities okay. another volume of research by dr jan stevenson who was the head of the department of psychiatry at the university of virginia and from the university press itself there was a book published by him called 20 suggestive cases of reincarnation so what he did through 30 or 40 years, he traveled around the world and collected roughly 3,000 cases of reincarnation claims. And uh, his goal was to uh, negate them, to find out flaws in those claims and uh, try to end the debate of reincarnation. But, I mean, what was his goal? He could not uh, attend that. Rather, many of the cases he found, okay, they are flawed, some were made up, okay? But 20 cases at least, he found that there is no flaw. I mean, it cannot be explained. So, such a small child, you cannot you know, teach <coughs> anyone or anything to act. And uh, even there are some tribes where these, the, so the concept of reincarnation and soul is not there in that tribe. They are not such an advanced thing. They don't normally think like that. So, in those, Areas also there were reports. So otherwise, people explain that it's totally ingrained into your you know, upbringing, and then you tend to believe something, and there is some effect. It's not like that. There is another book where reincarnation and biology intersect <coughs> by the same uh, professor. <coughs> Children who remember past lives, and uh, after uh, beginning his research, Journal of American Medical Association says. Dr. Stevenson had painstakingly and unemotionally collected a detailed series of cases in which the evidence for incarnation is difficult to understand on any other grounds. He has placed on record a large amount of data that cannot be ignored. <coughs> Dr. Brian Weiss, uh, MD Chairman Emeritus of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai Medical Center, Miami. Uh, again, so when uh, he tried to counsel uh, his patients and found out that many of them actually remember their past lives. So from that experience, uh, this book was written. Okay. Another, so I am citing only books written by doctors and neurologists. There are many books by uh, popular authors, which I am not putting here in this forum. Okay. So there is another book by psychologist uh, Carol Bauman, How Past Life Memories Affect Your Child. So there are many peculiar behavior of uh, many child. For example, uh, many babies are afraid of water, for example. But normally you expect 
or water or fire or any other things. And it's peculiar because normally you expect that after you have an accident, then they will try to be afraid of that thing. So if a child is about to be drowned in water and is saved marginally, and then later it develops uh, a phobia, that is natural. That also happens in our lives, okay? Even an adult human being can develop a phobia like that. But uh, uh, many child have some strange phobias which cannot be linked to any event in the present life. And through, uh, for example, uh, counseling and through hypnotism, you know, she could actually make those